and uh, feel free to uh, interrupt me if you want to ask questions um, or if you want you can wait till the end just remember that uh, usually you'll be on mute by default so you have to click on the microphone to speak and also please turn it off after you finish otherwise there will be a lot of background noise and interferences yeah i just kept the mic open so just in case i want to you know ask something i want to say something uh it's it's just there hmm. is that okay Alex? but you don't come out oh, this particularly with a lot of noise right now so i guess it's fine yeah okay thank yeah. you it depends on the environment really well aaron has a good advice i always keep forgetting the functionality of zoom uh, we're trying to get rid of it. It's a commercial thing, so. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Whoops. First of all, what is Agora Speakers International? So Agora Speakers is a worldwide nonprofit education foundation. We are recognized as such. We are legally registered and uh, in the European Union. And our goal is mainly educational. We are here to train people in a set of certain sets of skills and abilities. And uh, we are non-profit. And our recognition extends to private companies that, well, some of them like Google and Microsoft are recognized as a non-profit foundation and they are helping us with basically free software, free services and things like that. So our let's say mission, which you can see on this slide, is mainly related to two areas of training. One is communication or public speaking, and the other one is leadership. <clears throat> I do want to emphasize that no part of this mission is, let's say, wishful thinking or superfluous or redundant or could be deleted, especially the last part. The last part that says that the people that we train actively um, build a better world. Our goal as a foundation is to create an environment, a win-win environment between the people that are being trained and the communities in which they live. So we expect the people that we train, the communicators that we train, the leaders that we train, during their own process of training to be actively involved with their community. And that creates a very positive win-win dynamics because there is nothing more empowering than actually leading a project in the wild. It doesn't have to be a pharaonic project like bring sanitation to a city, but it can be a small, and in fact, we favor those. We favor those because they are small, they are constrained, they are manageable, uh, and they are very instruction, instructive. So you can do a small project in your community that will help you develop as a leader. You will see where your shortcomings are. Maybe it was planning, maybe it was execution, maybe it was design, maybe you omitted some stakeholders and then you run into problems. <clears throat> but as I mentioned, there's nothing more empowering as being able to actually put the things that you're learning into practice and see that they have a really lasting effect in the real world. Because otherwise, usually there are a lot of training programs and seminars that yes, they teach you leadership and leadership skills, but it's just like, I don't know, uh, watching a course on, on swimming. Yeah, sure, you can keep all day watching courses on how to swim properly, but at the end of the day, you will have to swim if you really want to become a good swimmer. So here's the same thing. And, um, I mentioned that it's a win-win because obviously the communities in which uh, our clubs work are benefit from all this approach. Yeah, actually, when I when I saw the site, when I saw Agora Speakers International with the objectives that you have, um, it coincides with our advocacies. Um, I am currently the the VP operation of uh, an organization here, a youth organization, wherein I am the head of the health committee. I, I do speakership. Uh, we, uh, I, I, we do HIV awareness, SOGI, uh, mental health uh, for, for universities here in Candon City, Ilocos Sur. So, and when I see this, 
Yeah, it's, I, I, we have a, a yeah. lot of overlapping then, and that's always always great. Uh, regarding what Jay is, um, is asking, uh, we do plan to offer, uh, to the extent that we can, this, uh, those benefits to our clubs, meaning, for example, free hosting on our cloud infrastructure of websites, if they want to. I mean, we, we don't plan to force anyone to do anything, but it will come as an option. So, yep, the, the goal is sharing those uh, benefits. <clears throat> Okay. So Aura right now is present in 70 something countries. Uh, we have uh, 102 registered clubs and quite a few unregistered, unfortunately. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So here are some, well, of course, I, I beyond my capability to, to put pictures of all of them, but to mention just a few of them, uh, top to bottom and left to right, you have three clubs from Portugal. You have the club in Jakarta, then the one in Madrid, then the one in Singapore in the second row, then the one in Kathmandu in Nepal, then the one in Parl in South Africa, then uh, the bottom row, the one in Gorzo Wielkopolski. I'm not sure I pronounced it correctly in Poland. Then the one in Amman in Jordan, and one in Jordan, and the uh, last one is the one in Tokyo in Japan. So as you can see, they are quite a varied bunch, and uh, we have a lot of uh, energy as a foundation. I hope you're also excited <clears throat> by what I'm going to share with you. First of all, our main avenues of communication. Most of the things that we have uh, in terms of static documentation, educational materials and things like that are on the website, on the wiki more than on the first one. We did roll out recently a worldwide real-time chat that's based on that domain, but it was like two weeks ago. So it will still take some time to catch on. And right now, our main avenues for communication with everyone uh, are the Facebook groups. We have one international group, and then we have separate groups for, for each country. We are trying to move away from Facebook, first of all, uh, but it will, it will take some time. First of all, because not everyone is comfortable being on Facebook, especially due to privacy concerns and all the recent incidents and uh, data breaches. And second, because uh, we need to have control of uh, our data. We have uh, to a big dependency on Facebook right now. When we move to our own systems, it will, we are only going to require an absolute minimum of, of data from our members, like an email to get in touch with them and then a country and, and a city and that's it. And the clubs, obviously, to which they belong. Well, we have presence in the other social networks like uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, some other less popular, uh, more in the East, like Kentucky and, and all that. Well, they are a bit abundant because we don't have yet a lot of presence, but uh, we are on Xing as well. But mainly right now, realistically, the main avenue for communication is, is Facebook. And we are trying to move away from it. Okay. <clears throat> so what are the things that we train? We see this as a three legs thing that basically supports one core skill or ability that is leadership. And that, those leadership skills, or the part of the educational program that is centered, uh, built around leadership, has three supporting pillars. One of them is public speaking, where we follow a traditional approach in public speaking education, in people learning to speak in front of an audience, learning how to structure a speech, how to transmit a message, how to use clear language, clear and concise language, how to use vivid language, how to use body language, vocal variety, how to use humor in speeches, how to use anecdotes or personal stories in speeches. And the interesting thing is that most people tend to think as publics of, of those skills that we train in public speaking as something that is exclusively for speaking in front of an audience. But it, that's far from true. And uh, as people start learning more and more skills and techniques, for communicating a clear message, because after all, that's the whole point of it, they realize that they are becoming much more effective in one-to-one -one communications with their partners, with their business partners, with their bosses, with their with a prospective uh, hiree or hire. 
And that's quite an interesting thing to, to watch. Another pillar that is uh, quite now uh, rel very relevant is the one about critical thinking with all these things going on about fake news and all that. In critical thinking, our main goal is providing people the tools that they need to be able to discern whether something or the accuracy of the information or the message that they are getting and how truthful it can be. Unlike uh, other initiatives that have been around, especially, well, the ones from, from Facebook are notorious, but there have been several attempts here in the European Union to, to do something similar, in which those entities try to tell you directly whether something is true or not, or whether this is fake news because we say so and no. Agora doesn't tell you what is true and what is not true, so we don't tell you vaccines uh, vaccines are, are useful you should uh, vaccinate your children or uh, or evolution is true no we, instead we try to give people the tools so that they can make their own judgment call about what they receive so for example we teach them to detect logical fallacies we teach them to detect manipulation in statistics we teach them to be aware of our own psychological and cognitive biases when we are evaluating events and in general, we teach them to recognize when mm, something, when someone may be trying to, to manipulate them, especially in stories that mix emotional content with factual content. These are quite common as well. And we consider that a critical skill for a leader. And actually, it's uh, in, in every single statistic and uh, business paper that you see nowadays, you can see that critical thinking is regarded as one of the top soft core skills for, for success. And the third leg, leg would be debating. Debating is an interesting thing. There is a lot of research obviously supporting um, the effectiveness of debating is for developing certain skills. But we have a unique approach here because in most other debating clubs or contests, usually they follow the same general pattern. There are two teams. There is, a, I don't know, depending on the style, for example, if it's British parliamentary style, there is the government and the opposition, or is the uh, for and against. But the thing is that there are two teams defending antagonistic viewpoints on a problem, and the goal of the debate is winning uh, over the other team. The, the thing is that there is research that shows that this is useful, of course, but it develops a very, uh, it has its own share of problems. For example, it develops a very binary view of the world, a very dichotomical view in which there are only two viewpoints of a problem and nothing more. It's either for or against, there's no middle ground. And um, they, they create also an antagonism that is not very useful. Winning over the other team, that's something that will never happen in real life. I mean, you can absolutely never hope to convince someone of, accepting completely your, your viewpoint. So we have a special way of debating in which, first of all, we accept more than two teams for a particular problem. And uh, we encourage and we highly score and value the ability of teams to reach common ground and to reach compromises. So, it's more important actually, you get more points by finding common ground and things that you can agree on than winning over, which is, well, <laughs> something that probably will never happen. So let me give you an example. Imagine we are debating uh, high, school, uh, high school or university education and there's one team that supposes that this should be paid always and another team that supposes that, suppose that defends that it should be sponsored by the state, publicly funded. So we value, for example, more if those two teams can reach some common ground, which means giving a bit of your personal defense idea in exchange for reaching a consensus. And the middle ground in this case might be something like, okay, um, we both teams, we recognize that there are certain bright kids that have been born in adverse socioeconomical circumstances, and both teams agree that, okay, yes, for those kids, high school education should be free. <clears throat> and in general, the rules try to 
encourage both teams to reach out to find those compromise positions of compromise, which uh, um, I think creates a, encourages dialogue and a realistic situation in real life negotiations more than uh, purely antagonistic debates in which you either win or you lose. And um, about the, there's a question about social confidence as the opposite of social anxiety. We, I believe some of the skills, especially in the field of public speaking, do address that. Uh, we start very gently with very slow, limited um, programs, projects. But, so that will address shyness in general when interacting with other people. But for interpersonal skills as such, in some specific situations, uh, we have a special, a separate uh, educational track. I, I would say that uh, would address that particular concern. Okay, so what is the process by which our members acquire skills? Well, it's the same old tried and true cycle in which you first learn using the educational materials that we provide. Then you have to do something. You have to do a project, be that either presenting a speech or doing some social community project or analyzing some other speech. We have a lot of sections in the meetings. You'll, you'll see a bit later. And then you practice that in front of the club if it's something that can be done in, in the club or you just, you just provide a report of what, of what you did. And you get peer feedback on your performance, what we call evaluation. Now, I want to emphasize here that Agora is not a school in which there are teachers. Agora is not, a, I don't know, a webinar or a, or a course. And that all of the, let's say, learning experience will come mainly from peer feedback. And there's quite a lot of research that says, proves that this is quite an effective system. Usually the main concern that exists here, especially by newer members who are not very used to this, and they come a bit shy and say, okay, I just come to I just I just came to this club. I I barely started speaking in public yesterday. How am I going to provide evaluation or feedback to someone that is much more experienced than me than I am? And I always use the same analogy people that are giving an evaluation, they are merely providing their opinion. They are merely expressing how they felt as recipients, as uh, the target of what was just delivered and presented. For example, we all go to movies, we all go to restaurants, and of course, after you watch a movie, after you finish eating at the restaurant, you do have an opinion on what happened there. You do say, for example, to your friends, well, this movie sucked because the script was so predictable or the plot was, had so many holes or the acting was bad or the acting was good or it had great pacing or it was too slow. Or when you go to eat to a restaurant, you can 100% be able to say uh, the fish was raw, I didn't like it or the, 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 the waitresses or the waiters were too slow, the service was bad. So you're giving your opinion. You do have an opinion on those things, although you're not a professional director, you're not a professional movie maker, you're not an actor, you're not a cook, at least I'm not, but, but that doesn't stop you from having an opinion on that. <clears throat> what I must emphasize is that it's different. We don't pretend people to have an academic opinion on how the technological process of cooking happened in the kitchen. That's not the point. The point is you evaluate your, the finished product as you received it, how it made you feel. And it's the same thing with the speech in a product, in, in, in a project. If a speech left you indifferent, well then that's a valid point and that's a valid opinion. If it didn't stir within you anything, 
then that's an opinion you can give. That doesn't mean that you should say, and, you, and to fix that, you should do this and this and this. Of course, you can offer points for improvements, and that's the whole point of it. But it's merely expressing, an evaluation is merely expressing an opinion. Of course, the speaker or the person doing that particular project is free to take it or not. Well, the, the only thing obviously that we require is that the feedback be constructive and be actionable. So for example, you can't say merely your speech sucked. You must be specific what exactly you didn't like in my speech or what exactly didn't, didn't, you didn't like in my project. And it needs to be actionable, meaning that the person receiving the feedback should be able to do something about it. If you just say, well, you're too short, or your voice is too coarse. Well, excuse me, that's my head, that's my voice. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it uh, unless I go through surgery probably. So, and the same logic applies if you were a cook. If one person comes to you and says, uh, well, the fish was raw, I didn't like it, and the service was very slow, I would suggest that you do this and this and that. But you can take it or not take it. Clearly, the other person is not a cook. Fine, he's a customer though. But now if everyone or a majority in the restaurant starts telling you, oh, listen, your know, fish is a raw, the, ones, the fish that you're serving, then probably you should listen, although none of them are expert chefs. Same thing here in speeches. If uh, probably there will always be someone in the audience that is bored or indifferent or doesn't care and he'll give that kind of opinion. But at the end of the day, if everyone is telling you that, maybe you should, you should listen. But I insist, this is, these are not academic evaluations. Okay. Now, there are four main <coughs> pillars in, um, in this environment that we provide. The first of them is uh, the clubs. An environment that is supportive, that is friendly, that is encouraging, that is not hostile, in which uh, our members can feel safe in order to practice and not be afraid of being wrong or make mistakes. Of course, you will see that as the educational program develops and as people advance through more uh, advanced projects, we do require a lot of work outside of the club environment. So it's good to have a nest, a comfortable and cozy nest, but at some point you have to fly out of that nest and face real world audiences. We have, of course, the training program, which, uh, which is the training materials that we, we develop. One plus we have is the Agora community, which is a significant benefit from a roll, your roll your own variant of, of club in which uh, it gives you a great, a vast diversity of people, countries, opinions, viewpoints, and you can al always reach for advice or for uh, feedback, whether it's a speech or a project or an idea. And one thing we are going to start developing um, immediately after the convention, it has always been in the guide, but it was never specified fully, is the role of, of mentors, mentors in clubs, uh, either in clubs or in the worldwide community, because we don't intend to limit that to clubs only, are people that are more experienced in Agora and that lead new members through with their first steps in their first steps in, in the Agora educational program, probably in the first five projects, something like that. So our educational Materials are structured in paths, educational paths, and each path is structured in projects, individual projects. Each project requires that you do something and that you either do that project in front of the club or present the results of that project in front of the club. Some of the projects are related to community leadership. Some of the projects are related to public speaking, in which the goal is presenting a speech, delivering a speech in front of the club. Some are, uh, there are other interesting sections. Uh, in fact, most of the projects related, for example, to public speaking in the educational path, they have two sections, in which the first one is analyzing a speech from a particular viewpoint. So for example, if you have a project that is focused on vocal variety or on body language, probably the first part of that project would be analyzed someone else's speech 
from that viewpoint. That could be anyone's speech, just a speech that you like. No, doesn't need to be a famous actor or a politician. Could be just, a, I don't know, a commencement or a graduation speech by some in some university that you like. But the goal is, okay, let me see how good speakers do that. And that's a, a general trend in Agora. We try to run away from um, being too endogamic. We want our members to be exposed to a variety of speaking styles, like there's no one true style of speaking. We want our members to be exposed to different techniques and we want to, them to learn from, from the best out there. So in the speech analysis projects, for example, you would really get a speech from someone and start taking it apart, looking what he's doing, if it's the body language project, what he's doing with his hands, how he's moving on the stage, how he's looking at the, at the public, and then you will present that analysis to the club so that everyone can benefit from, from the analysis that you did. You will do something like, okay, here's the video, so look at how in minute one and three seconds he's doing this, exactly at the same time he's speaking about that. So this is actually a great learning exercise. And then as a second part of that project about vocal, uh, sorry, about body language, you will deliver your own uh, speech, including those, those techniques. But as I mentioned, there are quite a, a number of varied projects that, that we do in meetings. So about meetings. Meetings are a structured activity. I want to start with that, meaning that what happens in a meeting does follow an agenda, an agenda that needs to be known in advance, preferably some days in advance, not at the time of the meeting, although, well, uh, we do what we can, as always. And uh, it's important, and I'll mention, and there are several points in this presentation where I'll talk about that, it's important to clearly separate what are structured Agora meetings from the rest of the activities that an Agora club may, might do. Usually clubs also have social activities, that's fine. Many, many clubs meet before uh, the official start of the meeting and they just socialize or have drinks. Many have even dinner or after or before the meeting, that's perfectly fine. Uh, of course, the social part of Agora is important for creating a closely tight community but we shouldn't forget that the main goal of agora is educational and this has some connotations by the way that are important for us so for example for us it's very important to distinguish what are the boundaries of an agora meeting because uh, as you probably know by now we are free meaning that we don't charge anything to open public clubs so our financial sources are things like uh, corporate clubs they do pay but that's a minority right now, or private donations or um, grants, state grants. But the thing is, if during an Agora meeting, we get uh, what is called an Agora meet by, by a club, we get a lot of pictures or of people, I don't know, having drinks or having a dinner, it's very difficult for us to go to, yeah, to the European Union and say, hey, now we are Agora, uh, we, we are doing this in this kind of, uh, uh, activities, uh, can you fund us? And when they see the picture, they'll say, listen, guys, uh, we would happily fund you if you were doing educational work, but obviously we're not going to fund your parties. So that's why there are other connotations in, and that's why we insist on having like a clear beginning and a clear ending of an Agora meeting. And then of course, outside of that meeting, the club can do whatever they want. So all club meetings have a, have a meeting leader that is in charge of uh, this, making sure that the meeting progresses smoothly. And uh, all the roles, by the way, are documented. You'll see the links in the slides and I'll share the slides in the recording after, after the, the meeting is over. Uh, all the roles can be performed by, should be performed by different people every time so that they can, every member can benefit from the experience of being meeting leader or uh, someone in charge of the host question section or things like that. And now <clears throat> within the meeting, we have several sections. Each person, each section has a person that's responsible for it. And there are many, many sections that we have in, in, our, in our documentation and we keep adding new ones constantly. For example, 
we have the prepared speeches, which is the, the one most people are familiar with, or the hot questions, which are um, improvised, which um, are targeted at educating people in speaking, um, thinking on their feet and speaking without preparation, right? especially answering questions that might be uncomfortable for them. But we have other write novel, uh, rather novel sections like Today We Travel Do, which is aimed at fighting stereotyping and demonization or dehumanization of collectives. It has a name that is rather not connected to the action, but if you see the documentation, it has its point. So for example, we ask of members to pick a collective that is traditionally depicted as the enemy in their environment, be that, I don't know, uh, gypsies or Muslims or Christians, depending on who you are, or Russians in the US or Americans in Russia, and we ask them to present something positive about them uh, without trying to persuade, just speak positively about this particular collective. And uh, we have some transversal roles, which are uh, obviously there is a timer, and the goal of the timer is making sure that everyone stays within their allotted time. Otherwise, usually a meeting lasts between an hour and two hours. Uh, if there is no timer, then this can um, become a nightmare with meetings uh, going past three, four hours. The timer has a very gentle way even. It has the ability of kick someone, someone out of the stage. Uh, and she's gently. Uh, I saw in the documentation. <clears throat> and we have the role of the grammarian which who basically monitors the use of the language and uh, his goal is monitoring both incorrect and exceptionally correct or insightful uses of the language, like a particular idiom that was very well used or a particular sentence or a figure of speech or a metaphor, I don't know, things like that. And uh, of course we have this concept that is um, not novel by, by any means of the word of the day or the phrase of the day that encourages that first of all allows people to increase their vocabulary and second it has a more a deeper goal which is uh, training people to improvise or to react dynamically uh, in their speeches one of the things we absolutely do not recommend is for people to memorize what they're going to say because well there are many things that can go wrong if you memorize a speech top to bottom and going blank is not the worst of them you have to be exceptionally good to be able to memorize a speech and still sound natural. And that's the biggest problem with memorization. You don't come out as some, someone that is speaking naturally or from the heart. You just come out as something that is robotically reciting a speech, nothing more. And in fact, the, the challenge of the word of the day or the idiom of the day or the phrase of the day is that you should be able in something that you prepare to insert something that you don't know until the time of the meeting. So that forces people to not recite things like robots. It's all related to the same laws of training in a realistic, with realistic goals. And then of course, each section has its own evaluator. Evaluators, uh, of course, the public in general will give the presenter of that section their, their feedback in written form, but the evaluator does it in verbal form and in front of the club. And there are special evaluation cards for each project that detail what is necessary to, to look for or what are the criteria for evaluating the, that project. I, I wouldn't say scoring because that evaluation is not an exam, but on what things the, evaluation, the evaluator should be focusing. So for example, if this is a project about body language. Uh, the evaluation card would ask things like, did the, were the hands used properly? And did he, were they synchronized with the speech? So did he emphasize at the right points and not just move them randomly? Did he move properly on the stage, not too quickly? Were they big gestures? Were they small, constrained? Were they appropriate? And things like that to guide, because obviously, as I mentioned, evaluators are not academic. They don't know what, uh, what should, in general, they don't know what they should be looking for. So we guide them through for that. Uh, usually a typical meeting will go something like this. There is a general, uh, of course, clubs have a lot of flexibilities in designing their, their meetings. They have a lot of freedom uh, as to which sections to include, how many of them, uh, in which order, 
we do have certain requirements, but they are more requirements in general terms. So, for example, things like, well, a club should at least have four debates a year. Otherwise, that particular um, educational skill would be lacking if a club didn't use debates at all. Or, well, in each meeting, you should at least have one speech. Otherwise, what's the whole point of it? Or you're not training in public speaking then at all. And usually, um, you have an initiation part in which the meeting leader introduces, uh, in general, opens the meeting, talks a bit about Agora, talks a bit about uh, the goals of the foundation, what we're training the club. I ask the guests to introduce themselves, that's a bit uh, up to each club. And then he introduces the advisory roles, like the timer, and then the timer comes to the stage, speaks about his role, then the grammarian does the same. And then for each section, usually the procedure is the meeting leader introduces the evaluator of the section and the evaluator <coughs> speaks about, okay, this section is about, this section is a prepared speech, or this section is a speech analysis part, or this speech is a community project. And we do this, the goal of this section is, I know, training in body language, or the goal of this speech is, of this um, project is um, preventing stereotyping of collectives or whatever. And I'm going to be evaluating John or whoever is doing the speech or the project on this particular criteria. And then the person doing that particular section comes to the stage, he does it. And then usually the meeting leader gives some time to the audience for thinking about what they want to say in terms of feedback. And finally, the evaluator comes to stage and provides his evaluation. This is usually repeated for each section. And then we have a conclusion of the meeting in which um, the order can be varied, of course. First, the grammarian provides its report, points uh, to idioms that were well used, provides a report for filler words, provides a report for bad grammar. Uh, one thing I want to mention, by the way, is that, and you will see that in the core principles of Agora, we are very, um, let's say, combative in that everything that, the way we design our educational materials should be focused on actual scientific research. Because there's a lot of confusion in the field, both of leadership and of public speaking, especially in terms of celebrities. Okay, this guy is very famous, it's a very famous public speaker, and he says that this should be done this way, so everyone follows suit and do it without any, and that's really not very scientific. Maybe it was for him, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that it was for everyone else. So when we try to, when we recommend something in our materials, it's always be, be, because there is a scientific study or a body of scientific knowledge supporting that particular viewpoint. And for example, it's an interesting thing about, I mentioned about the filler words, and that's why I'm, I'm talking about this here. Usually, there is this idealistic goal of getting your speech completely rid of filler words, long vowels, and things like that. So uh, any such hesitations and doubts, any ums, ums, and all that is considered like totally bad. Your speech should be completely clear of that, zero. But research shows otherwise. Research shows that uh, if your speech is completely devoid of those, you come out as someone that is not natural. And there is nothing more important for a public speaker actually than being natural if he wants to convince people of anything. So there is a, of course, if you are constantly hesitating and constantly inserting like filler words and, and clutch words, then you lose authority. And again, your power of persuasion goes down. So there is like a golden, point that is close to zero, but is not exactly zero, that gives you the maximum, uh, let's say, efficiency in transmitting your message and convincing people. And that's why I mentioned that uh, we don't just uh, follow the crowd, as they say, we try to research on our own what works and what doesn't work, and we do require that thing, things are backed by solid research, not merely opinions by whomever. And at the end of the meeting, there is usually a um, uh, role that is called the meeting evaluator that does a, 
a general evaluation of the meeting. Was it on time? Was it uh, was the venue correct? He evaluates also the evaluators. Um, okay, let me see in the chat. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, in general, in Agora meetings, uh, you can use materials from other organizations. That's per that's perfectly fine as long as you own them. Meaning you didn't photocopy them illegally from someone else, especially if they are sold materials. And uh, it's okay even to have your own, uh, especially in the fields of public speaking, it's perfectly fine if you want to practice your own kind of speech with your own goals. For example, a best man speech or a sales speech or something like that, that's perfectly fine. The only thing is that we require, and, and clubs, by the way, are free to come with their own section. In meetings, we encourage that, we encourage experimentation. Uh, and by all means, please, if you come up with a section that you see it's, uh, as long as they are educational, of course. I mean, not a drinking contest. Uh, if, you, if you come up with a speech, uh, sorry, with a, with a meeting section that works very well, by all means, share it with us so that we can maybe add it to the, to the general, general program. The, the only thing that, as I mentioned, we require is that the sections be educational in nature, that this education be related to the goals of the foundation, public speaking, leadership, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that they are all evaluated because you don't learn if you don't get any feedback. That's the whole point of it. And in order for something to be evaluated, the criteria of, or the requirements for that evaluation should be known beforehand. So for example, if you want to practice a sales speech, or if you want to practice, I don't know, your best man speech at a wedding or whatever, you should say in advance, I'm going to do this, and these are the criteria that I want to be evaluated on, or these are the criteria by which uh, others should judge whether, or should have an opinion, whether I was successful or not. And then the evaluators will know what to look for, because otherwise it's just like random talk, and uh, there's no learning happening there. Yeah, you did give a speech, fine. Did you learn anything? Probably not. Uh, yeah, by, uh, in, uh, regarding the second part of that question in the chat, whether it's okay to combine members from um, different organizations, uh, yes, of course, but just have in mind that the materials of Agora are, will be available. Right now they are open, but that's something we're moving away from, and I'll explain a bit later why. The materials of Agora will be available for Agora members only. They will be free, but we are going to restrict uh, the access to them. I'll explain a bit later why. But of course, there's no, no problem in doing that. And unlike other places, we're more than happy to have members that are in Agora being members of other organizations, the more the merrier. And in fact, we do have this viewpoint that since we are an educational foundation and the goal is educating people, well, the more education they get, the better. So, fine, if you attend one course from our university, if you want to go to 10 other universities, by all means, the more training you get, the better you will be. But this is so because, after all, we don't charge anything, so we don't have a particular goal of, I don't know, hoarding members and keeping them for ourselves because we're making money out of them. No, nope, really, we don't. You don't pay us anything, so that's not the, the point of it. Uh, and we do, have, we do strive, and we're careful about that, by the way, we do strive to have a closely knit community, but we constantly remind everyone that that is not a synonym of being a sect or a cult or something that is, uh, becomes too sectarian. Uh, creating an attitude of no, we're the best and it's us versus the world or us versus them. That's not attitude. Now, some meeting sections, as you can see here, well, there are some quite traditional ones like prepared speeches, uh, speech evaluation. There are others which are quite novel, like the travel to sections I mentioned, and we keep adding sections uh, constantly. It's impossible for a club to have all the sections in a meeting, especially if you consider that something like a club debate takes usually uh, a good hour, and that will probably eat for, I don't know, 70% of the whole meeting time. But clubs are free to combine them 
um, as long as they meet the, the minimum requirements yearly, usually. We have also quite novel sections in the advanced paths more than in the basic one, like for, for example, against all odds, in which we train people in overcoming, let's say, unexpected situations when they're delivering a presentation, which is unfortunately quite a realistic scenario. For example, you prepare a super uh, fantastic presentation, you go there and the projector breaks in the middle of the presentation. Of course, you cannot just say, well, sorry, uh, that was it. Do you have any questions? No, you have to elegantly get out of that situation. Or, I don't know, super typical circumstances in which the microphone doesn't work, or the speaker before you takes half of your time, or and what you have, you know, what you had planned for 15 minutes, now you have to deliver in seven. Or even, or sometimes even worse, when he talks about the same thing that you had planned and you didn't know. So now you have to be making content on the fly, otherwise the audience will be bored to death. So, uh, and these are things that can happen happen during your normal presentation, like we simulate a failure to train you for that, to practice for that. So as you can see, there are a lot of uh, interesting things here. Uh, at the bottom, you have the link for the sections that are documented. And now, linking to that, how is the educational program structured? Uh, we have a basic educational path that is composed of 16 projects. We start from very gentle beginnings, very short roles that require just, I don't know, one, two minutes maybe on the stage. Some roles, especially like the timer or field awards report you can do from your seat, although that's not very recommended speaking about the things that you like or like a general presentation, who am I? Those are theoretically easy speeches, although things like who am I are quite philosophical sometimes, but they are at least short. So maybe you're speaking for two, three minutes. And then as we move on to more developed parts of the, or more advanced, so to say, part of this basic educational path, speeches start getting longer, up to 10 minutes and they start using more advanced resources, like humor and not jokes, humor, two different things, anecdotes, personal stories, emotion, things like that. We do train, for example, for presentation software or inconvenient eyes using a microphone. It's, uh, it's, it's a necessary evil because it's taking one of your hands usually if you don't have the luxury of a label microphone or uh, things like that. So you do have to get constrained in your movements, but it's something that you need to cope with in, in the real life sometimes. And then we have, each of these projects has their own like requirements, goals, um, and regarding other organizations, we do recognize the work that you've done in them. So it's up to you whether you want to do the project again or, or not. I don't need to say that most of these projects do have two, two steps, which is the speech analysis part, and the speech presentation part. In the speech analysis, you actually have to analyze the speech from someone else, as I explained before, from the viewpoint of speech development, meaning linguistic resources used, or speech structure or body language. Again, with the goal of exposing the club and your, yourself to a variety of speaking styles. And then we have some advanced paths, of which right now, in, in full honest and transparency, only two are ready which are the ones about storytelling and educational speeches. And uh, we still haven't made them available because we're waiting for the online portal to be completed. Because right now, our, as I mentioned, our materials are open to everyone. And this encourages a situation in which we have clubs that are not officially registered with us. We have about uh, 102 clubs, a dozen of them, uh, there are a dozen additional clubs that are not registered. And this is a situation that also hurts us. First of all, because it limits the possibilities of what we can do in a country. I mean, it's a different situation if we have like 10 clubs in a country or if we have 20. We can um, provide more opportunities for members. We can organize regional conferences. Uh, we can do a lot of things. And uh, second, it hurts us for the same reason that I mentioned in terms of uh, funding, uh, presenting ourselves to ourselves to companies and uh, state institutions. Because if you go to a company or the European Union again and ask for a grant and you say, and they ask you, okay, 
what's your size? And you say, well, we have 20 clubs in the world. And they say, okay, well, come back when you, when you are something more. It's, it's a different thing if you go there and say, okay, we have 200 clubs or we have 500 clubs. So that's why it, again, since we don't have any financial gain directly from clubs themselves, we do ask them to register. And that's why we need to start restricting that uh, access to encourage that registration. It doesn't cost anything, but still we need it. We need to know how, how the realistic picture of Agora out there. Uh, one thing I, I should mention is that all of the advanced paths, there is a special presentation that details the project in the projects that uh, exist in each of these advanced paths. Many of them require working outside of the club, not from the very beginning, but at least on somewhere around the middle. Uh, the numbers are the number of projects in each path. So for example, in storytelling, you have 10, 10 projects or speaking for entrepreneurs, you have 10 projects again. And you start, of course, by delivering, I don't know, a, an elevator speech or a sales speech or, or an investment speech of your product within the club. But at some point we are going to tell you, okay, you're advanced enough, please go outside of the club, go to a meeting with a venture, uh, with business angels, with venture capitalists, or if it's a storytelling, we're going to ask you, okay, go to a storytelling club or go to a stand-up comedy club if, you, if you're doing the track on humorous speeches and do it there because at the end of the day, that's the goal. The goal is not becoming a great, a great Agora member for the benefit of Agora. The goal is being trained in what interests you in to be able to apply it in real life, not just in, in general. In, in Agora. Again, as I mentioned, we run away from being too endogamic. And uh, youth clubs, for example, are an example of um, a question, an answer that I provided earlier, whether clubs can invent their, can make up their own sections or have their own new formats. Uh, we didn't initially have youth clubs. A member from Portugal, Jorge Diaz, that is organizing the convention, by the way, he came up with this initiative and he organized the first youth club there. And it was quite a success, as you can see. And then other people joined, like uh, Fred Jones from Canada. And they are all now leading the, they're leading the work group on creating a special educational path for young children. We don't have an age limitation in, in Agora clubs. We consider that anyone that is like, I don't know, 14, 15 years and above can join an adult club if the laws of the country allow it, uh, whether they can be alone or they must be accompanied by a tutor <clears throat> or a parent. And of course, there's no upper, upper limit. And uh, for people that are younger than 14, we usually do recommend the let's say the youth version, which is shortened, simplified, but it still teaches, teaches the same consequences. <clears throat> so our learning materials, they are located on the online wiki, most of them. Well, most of them, no, sorry, all of them. In the form of downloadable eBooks, PDF files, we usually recommend only using what you need immediately. So for example, if um, <clears throat> someone is going to deliver a project on focused on body language, then they can print out or use whatever is in the documentation for that particular meeting. We don't encourage printing like 100 copies in advance because we're constantly updating the wiki, we're constantly adding content, mm -hmm. we're improving the content and adding new sections. So basically, the moment they download the ebook, probably two days later, it's already outdated. But well, it's a, it's a useful format. And we are going to have printed books uh, as soon as the second edition of the Agora Guide is ready in about a week and a half at most. And these are books that are already sold, obviously, through Amazon but they don't contain anything that is not on the in the online documentation so it's just for people that prefer a more traditional format a more physical paper touch but still as i as i mentioned it's just an option so we're not going to it's not going to be like a club with basic membership and then we have you have premium membership no it's just preference and then we have forums 
we use our own system. Right now, they're only open for the people that are in charge of the youth program, but we intend to roll them out somewhere next week after the, after the convention is over. And work groups for doing, for helping us build Agora, because I always insist, insist that Agora is a common thing. So work groups for the youth program, for the contest that are going to roll, we are going to roll out next year, for different new sections that we want to incorporate, and uh, forums are in general a better way of cooperating and collaborating than some real-time chat. This is a question that also comes often, whether we offer any certificates. Uh, we always tell them that your focus shouldn't be the certificate, your focus should be learning. Yeah, you get a certificate at the end of the program, but really, if you rush through it, if you, you're, you will be only lying to yourself. You, yeah, you get the paper, uh, whatever value <clears throat> employers or whoever you're going to show it to give, give to it, that's fine, but it, the real goal should be really progressing um, through the program at a pace that you feel comfortable with. And since I see that um, there are quite a, que a few questions regarding to comparison with how other organizations work, we don't have like a quality program for clubs in which we measure clubs in terms of how many members they recruited or whether their members completed so many educational projects because that creates and that's a common problem with all metrics based organizations in which people, when they are confronted with a metric by, by which their quality or their performance is judged, they unfortunately tend to focus on the metric and forget uh, or on the leaves and forget what the end goal was of the whole thing and what the ultimate goal was, which was education. So we, uh, we have core certificates that are awarded by us, by Agora Speakers International centrally in digital format. Unfortunately, the other side of the coin of not mm, receiving any money from members is that we can, we don't have unfortunately the budget for uh, printing certificates and mailing them. Uh, it's an option by people that want it, but well, that's a paid option, obviously. And clubs can introduce their own additional certificates if they want to, as, as long as the certificates are related to something that is educational and. Uh, aligned with the goals of the foundation. So you can have, I don't know, best uh, hot questions speaker or best uh, meeting leader, but uh, best chef, well, not exactly. We will be also rolling badges, which are conforming to the open budget standard. That's a bit for those of you that don't know it. They are like images with an embedded uh, code, so to say barcode or QR code that can be scanned and analyzed in the sense that if you plant, if you use that digital badge on your CV on LinkedIn or somewhere else, uh, anyone can click on it and they are signed so they can, a prospective employer, for example, can check what this badge is about, what did you do in order to earn it, uh, who, who gave it to you, and all that is incorporated into the image. It's just an image, but it's an intelligent kind of image. Now, the interesting part, I guess, about how new clubs are created. Well, we have several core requirements for clubs, for open public clubs especially. First of all is neutrality, meaning Agora doesn't endorse or encourage a particular viewpoint on the world. Again, we're not here to tell people what to think or how to think. So clubs cannot do that either, meaning a club cannot be used as a vehicle for endorsing or promoting a, a political party or a religion or a particular economic viewpoint or anything remotely similar to that. No matter how right it may seem to us, no matter how correct, even if it's something like almost universally accepted, such as, I don't know, freedom of speech or equality or things like that, uh, we're not about that because the problem is that not all the countries in the world think the same way. And uh, if Agora starts having a, like a, an official position on some issues in the world, that can create problems for members of Agora in those countries. 
And the goal of Agora is not starting here. Some, we don't have like a political agenda. We don't want to, to do subversive stuff. Uh, I mentioned which, which are our financing, so, financing uh, finance source, sources of funds. So it's not like we're funded by some, I don't know, hidden organization or the CIA and want to promote here uh, some kind of revolutions. Uh, no. Of course, each, each person individually, they can, and in fact, the club is required to tolerate any kind of speech content, as long as it's not hate speech or something like that. So I don't know anyone can talk about anything as long as uh, it's not violent. But uh, even if it's something that other members find completely disgusting or, I don't know, disagreeable with, well, it's a fact of life that people have broad opinions. And in fact, our evaluators shouldn't be, cannot go into the content of the speech. The goal of an evaluator is not starting to argue with the presenter on, well, I don't agree with what you said, because I think otherwise, and here are my arguments. No, the goal is the delivery. There are some projects, of course, in which they, they have to enter into the content, but most of the time, anyone can talk about whatever they want to. There is also a requirement of equality, meaning that clubs cannot discriminate by gender, by race, by ethnic origin, by social economic status, by political affiliation, by abilities or disabilities, as long as the member is able to follow the educational path, they should take him, him in, uh, subject to space availability, obviously, because at the end of the day, the venues are limited sometimes, and you have a capacity for, I don't know, 15 attendees or 20 or 30, and you just don't have space for more. Th that, by the way, implies that uh, except in very 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 specific situations which we consider are minorities in danger that need protection we don't accept things like male only clubs or in saudi arabia or female only clubs anywhere because that's a form of gender discrimination clubs must exercise tolerance that's connected to what i mentioned before about members being able to speak about whatever they want and clubs should be non-profit, obviously. Um, I'll talk a, a bit uh, later about fees that clubs can charge. That is allowed because clubs need to sustain themselves. But obviously, the funds that clubs uh, obtain, they shouldn't be used for any personal profit. And one last core criteria that we have is the requirement for intellectual honesty. Intellectual honesty has two legs, so to say. One of them is the ability to continuously monitor and examine critically your own beliefs and ideas and keeping an open mind. We try to teach that your ideas and you as a person are two different things. So just because some idea of yours is uh, being argued against, I don't like to use the word attacked, but if someone is arguing about some of your ideas, especially during a debate section, session, or if one idea is like co completely disproved because that, that can happen, you should dissociate that from yourself. And it's that it's okay to admit that you were wrong about something and learn from that and improve. In fact, it doesn't make you a, wor a, a worse person, it makes you a much better person and much more successful one, by the way. People that are being able to admit that they were wrong on something. So this ties in with, uh, in fact, if you read the legal registration, you'll see that we do want to encourage technological thinking and the use of the scientific method and things like that for the exploration of the world. And that, of course, comes to intellectual honesty. Now we have four club types. <clears throat> We have open public clubs, which are the ones that we are mostly most interested in creating, which are clubs that admit everyone. There are no requirements for joining them other than, well, space availability. We have public interest clubs that are clubs that have restricted membership, but they do serve a public purpose. And their restriction is due to the fact of the place where they meet most of the time. So for example, Clubs that are in prisons or in penitentiaries, obviously, well, their membership is limited to the population in that particular prison. Or clubs that are a most, more, much more common case, fortunately. Uh, clubs that are in schools usually are limited to 
the students, faculty, and maybe parents of, of the students. Or clubs that are in governmental institutions usually are limited to civil servants working in those institutions. But as long as the club is in a, an institution that serves a public purpose, uh, we consider it a public interest club, and they are also free of charge uh, in everything, just like open public clubs. Now, we do have clubs that do have to pay fees to us. Restricted clubs are, for example, clubs that limit their membership to, and, 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 you, and as you see in the fee structure of, of the organization, the more a club restricts membership, the more we charge it. Because we consider that, well, after all, uh, we have invested a lot of effort in order to develop something that is good for, hopefully, for everyone. So if some, someone wants to take that and use it only for his personal goal and only for his personal benefit of some commercial entity, then uh, it's fair that he should pay. So restricted clubs would be clubs that require membership in another organization, for example, I don't know, the ICM or um, being a registered lawyer or being a registered doctor or things like that, professional associations, or clubs that are restricted to members only of those professional associations, they do have a fee. And clubs that exist in companies and that they are, they, where they only allow employees of the company to attend, corporate clubs, they do pay a fee as well. I, I must, uh, point out that it's not related so much as to where the club meets, meets, but about the restrictions that are imposed on the membership. So for example, a company can provide a venue for a club to meet, but as long as anyone can go there to that club, even if, it's not a, even if he's not an employee of that company, then that is still an open public club, even, if, even though it meets on, on the premises of a commercial entity. And in fact, we give, um, corporate clubs, all the possibilities so that they can waive the fees because really we're not so much interested in collecting the fees as, as in outreach. So for example, if a corporate club, a corporate club can waive the first two years of, of their fee if they sponsor or they mentor a public club in the same region, meaning they create a public club and they step in and they lead it and they stabilize it, then fine. Oh, you, you have contributed to the community, not financially, but in terms of, um, making making our program available to others in that particular region. There are, as I mentioned, a set of operational requirements, which are things like, uh, well, there's a whole table in the wiki, you'll see it, in terms of, well, whether the club should, um, should accept guests or not, whether, how many, um, I don't know, how many debates you should, you should have per year, whether it could use a customized educational program, or things, things like that. As, uh, right now, we are not, uh, it's, it's complicated to track those and we're not, uh, it's, we're not paying too much attention, honestly. These are just guidelines for now. But uh, as we roll out the online club management system, it will be much easier for each club to see exactly where they, they stand. Yep. Sorry, I can barely. Uh, I think that's not gonna work. Maybe if you have a question, maybe you can you can type it on the chat. There's too much background noise. Okay, so what's the recipe for success in club creation? Well, I would say that's the recipe for success in life in general, and it's start now, meaning many times people just wait for uh, the perfect moment, the perfect situation, the perfect venue, the perfect membership group, and um, it just doesn't work that way because that's never going to happen. There is one club, for example, I always use that as an example. I won't say the country, but they have been planning what they call uh, the club bylaws for about a year now. And of course, it doesn't seem like they are anywhere near that. 
And uh, when sometimes someone tells me, yeah, we've planned the meeting for after October or in a month and a half, because you see now it's election period here. And I tell them, listen, any, any, any plan that you make that is more than two weeks away from today is just wishful thinking because it's never going to happen. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be either elections or if, not, if it's not elections, it's going to be Christmas or the start of the school year or the end of the school year or some local party. There's always something happening. I mean, the world is not waiting for you to, to create your club. So just start. Just start, even if it's not perfect, even if you don't have the perfect venue. And make mistakes. Yeah, of course, we make mistakes all the time. The problem is that, and there are many studies about whether at the end of the day, it, there is a better quality if you launch something and iterate a lot versus whether you spend a lot of time in design and thinking. So you can spend a whole year on the, on the shore of the beach training your perfect posture in swimming, but probably when you actually start swimming, you're going to be much louder, louder than someone that started swimming uh, nine months, or months earlier than you. Even he didn't have the perfect outfit or the perfect posture. So yeah, make mistakes, learn from them, ask for feedback from your members, from the global community, consult with us. We do have quite a lot of experience by now in building clubs and iterate. It's the same, well, those in the IT field would recognize this as some sort of agile loop. And it is. Start as soon as you can. Make mistakes, learn, iterate many times. And you'll get better much quicker than if you give it a lot of thought and search for perfection. Now about the actual process. Well, the first thing that you need to start up, start with is with knowledge of how we work, how Agora works. And that you can do by a train, attending, attending trainings like this, uh, reading the documentation, which is all online, as I mentioned, um, reading the, uh, what we call the Agora guide, which is like the compendium of everything. The one that we have is relatively out of date. Unfortunately, a new one is due in two weeks, but we go again to the same principle. Don't wait for the perfect guide because that's never going to exist. In two weeks, we, as I mentioned, we constantly add new things. So even the guide that is going to come out in two weeks, in two weeks plus one day, it's already going to be outdated. But it's better than nothing. So, or it's better than waiting forever. Use the one that exists now, it's more than enough for starting. We have it in quite a few languages, so uh, hopefully that helps. We have some recorded demo meetings. They are realistic meetings, meaning they are very old. They, they were recorded when we started, one in English, one in, in Spanish. And uh, they were quite accidented, meaning that, uh, well, we allowed remote participants. There were problems with the connections and the venue was not ideal. But the main point was that we didn't want to record a meeting with actors or some simulated thing because that's not the reality of the situation. We do want to show clubs that these things happen in real life. You're never going to have something perfect with everyone so also smiley, also photogenic in, in a perfect, uh, like impeccable uh, venue. That's not the, the real life. And so people shouldn't obsess themselves with trying to achieve something that's not really uh, a real club meeting. Now, some practicalities. You don't have to decide on a club name, obviously. Uh, the biggest, uh, geographical or socio-geographical entity that uh, we allow in the club name is the city. Because if someone takes the name of the country, like, I don't know, Agora Speakers France, that can be confused as if that club somehow represents the whole France. And there are no clubs more important than others. Some, certainly some clubs have been running already for three, year, three years, which is how, our, how old our foundation is. But that doesn't make them more important, just more experience, nothing else. Nothing more. And it must be unique within the boundaries of the city because obviously otherwise it would be a mess for people in that city. And it's completely optional if you want to include Agora or not in the name of the club. So some clubs like 2035 speakers, that's perfectly fine. Uh, Agora is uh, entirely optional. Advanced speakers of Paris would be okay. 
the only things that are not okay is when they create confusion with the confusion with the general international organization. So you cannot have a club called uh, I don't know Agora Speakers International in Paris. No. Then usually we recommend that each club has a logo. It works much better for marketing and also for creating a community, a sense of identity by the members of the club. You can use a totally new logo. You can use a derived logo, which means taking part of our logo and combining it in some way. We don't encourage that. The flame is quite popular, uh, I guess. But some people take other parts of the logo, that's fine. Well, there are some new nuances in the sense that, okay, you take part of our logo and you create your own. You can't register a copyright on that, obviously. Or you can use, a, if you don't want or don't have the time to come up with your custom logo, we can create what we call a standard logo, which is basically taking the Agora logo and uh, using the club name that you've come up with, with uh, our standard colors. And nothing is written in stone, meaning that you can always change later. Again, don't wait for perfection for coming out with the perfect name. You can always change it later. So just start now with some name, more or less, agreeable members agree with and uh, you can always change it later just as the logo so the logo obviously is a bit difficult especially if you have a lot of printed materials okay now the club fees as i mentioned clubs can charge fees may, they may charge fees if they want and in fact we do recommend that clubs charge fees for their own uh, for supporting their own operation of course the fees should be reasonable, but we don't, uh, that's up to each club. I mean, how much they want to charge with what frequency, that's entirely up to each club. You may want to charge per meeting for, I don't know, offsetting the costs of the venue, for example, $3 a meeting, $5 a meeting, whatever. You may charge per, per month, $50 a month, or $1 million a month, that's entirely your choice. Well, if you find members able to pay that amount, please tell me, I want to have a chat with them. And the frequency as well, you can charge per year. The thing is that the moment you start charging fees, there are very strict financial requirements that we have in terms of transparency and how the money is used. Because we've been in places in other organizations where that is subverted rather quickly. So for example, if you charge fees, then you have to have your accounting public, meaning that every single expenditure, every single uh, fund uh, that you, every single income that you get must be documented and must be available for all Agora members worldwide. Not only the members of your club, but the whole organization. And uh, when I say every single, I'm talking about line items and not some aggregate form. Of course, the club, the funds must only be used for the oper sustaining the operation of the club and not for some, I don't know, profit uh, reason. And uh, significant expenditures, well, you have the link there for the financial rules, significant expenditures must be approved by members. And that approval only lasts for one year. It must be renewed. So for example, if someone wants to spend, I don't know, two thirds of the club's budget on subscriptions to courses, to online courses, I don't know, such as Udemy or Linda or some other public speaking courses that you may find out there, that's fine, but that approval lasts only for one year. On each year, the members would need to re-examine that decision and vote again. And we do that because, well, uh, if members voted five years ago about something, that doesn't mean that today's membership still agrees with it. And then you need to come up with the meeting frequency. And it's up to you how often you want to meet. The only thing on that we do require is that you meet at least 12, uh, 12 times a year, basically one time a month. Otherwise, if you meet less frequently, it becomes too spread out in time and the continuity is lost, basically. What, um, I have a, a question. Yeah. Um, what if I'm already a member, a part of an organization, and um, we, um, yeah, this is like a youth organization, uh, basically composed of youth leaders, okay, and based in our local, 
Okay? And yeah, we have some activities. We have advocacy works as well. We do public speaking, uh, you know, events in a way. And um, we re- we're really opting to, you know, um, because for, for us, growing and learning is continuous. And we find Agora as like very helpful. Uh, the technical things that Agora is offering and considering that it's free, uh, can can I use my organization as as a club or something like that, or do I need to create a new one? What do you think, Alex? Actually, that's a, a very interesting question. We hadn't thought about that until we came to Cameroon, and there was a whole network of clubs that offered to affiliate with us, and we said, "Oh, that's something interesting." And uh, the answer is yes. There are some. I mean, you. Regardless of whether the club is a new one or is embedded in another organization, the, the, the general requirements still apply within what happens in that club meeting. But it's perfectly fine. You don't need to create a new one. And in fact, that whole organization, we proposed to them such an agreement. We, uh, as a result of that, there is a procedure documented in the wiki. And they accept it. So uh, we're affiliating a whole network of, of clubs in, in Cameroon right now. And yeah, that's perfectly fine. Uh, the, the okay. only, yeah, the, the only thing is that a club using the principle of neutrality cannot be used as a vehicle for constantly promoting something because otherwise yes, it exactly. violates that principle, even if it's your the organization in which it, it is embedded. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, our club is non stock non-profit organization, and uh, it's also uh, already registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Oh, well, so we, okay. We also partner with stakeholders. We have, like, you know, different sections, different committees. Okay, but uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there are dynamics uh, for every event. We we do articles. We uh, do meetings. I do presentation. So okay. we yep. also do I mean, definitely, grant, right? And, uh, uh, you, you, your choice, whether you, especially for those activities that are related, to, because some. Some organizations are not purely related to public speaking or leadership. Some of them do, I don't know, environmental work, like uh, going out in the fields and planting trees. Well, that's def- that definitely cannot be an Agora meeting section because it's completely unrelated, although kudos to them, my full support. But it cannot be an Agora meeting uh, section. But in your case, where most of your activities overlap or have common ground with us, it's your choice whether you want to include them, even if they not follow the standard format within the meeting section, within the Agora meeting, or uh, outside of it. As, as I mentioned, clubs are free to create their own uh, sections, and uh, as long as they are educational and aligned with the goals of the foundation. And by all means, as I mentioned, share them with us, so maybe we can learn as well and improve our own educational program for the good of all clubs you know, worldwide. Yeah, I, think, I guess it would be a win-win situation if we'll be you know, uh, involved or we will adopt uh, you know, learnings that we will be having with Agara. Uh, sure, you, uh, we, we're not fanatical in terms of our program. As long as some section works or as long as some change to our section, sections or our method works, meaning that it's proven that it works and not just uh, we say so. Uh, by all means, we're open to changing it. Whatever works be- best for the whole community. Yes. Well, it's not really a matter of changing. It's a matter of, you know, whatever that we will be learning here, we want to apply it right away yeah. so that we could test if it's really working or not. And we could also do feedback. You could also do feedback with us. Something right. like that, you know. Like a dynamic. In yep, the, sure. Dynamic. Sure. That really the work. same loop that I mentioned before, but just applied to uh, on a more general level, at organizational level. Okay, so the next part is you need to find at least eight members, which is the minimum for a club. Uh, it's a rather skeleton type of minimum. We usually recommend a bit more, but that's the absolute minimum. There is, uh, for this one, there is no particular objective reason. We just had to put the, 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 the line somewhere between speaking to a group of friends in a table for people, that's definitely not public speaking, but we can't really require someone to have like 100 members in order to start a club. So, well, eight seemed like a reasonable, easy number to achieve, and you can already well, qualify that as some sort of non-ideal public speaking. 
And uh, a good way of recruiting new members is actually when a club starts in a, in a country or in a city, we usually do promotion, we help them find, grow new membership, we offer some possibilities. And there are a lot of members in the Agora Facebook groups. Not all the members are in the international group, by no means. I mean, for example, the, uh, uh, until one week ago, until one and a half weeks ago, the Agora Speakers International Group had like 1,900 members, and the Agora Speakers Ethiopia Group had 2,000 members. So yeah, since we don't have a centralized system yet, uh, and that's why when people ask me how many members I have, has, well, we have about 15,000 members worldwide, but that doesn't mean that they are all ascribed to clubs, because uh, I also give this example frequently. In Bangladesh, the first club chartered a month and a half ago with about 10 members, but we have like 200 and something people in Bangladesh, in Dhaka only. So, uh, yeah, uh, there is a lot of opportunity for finding prospective members in the Agora groups, even if we don't even have a club on the ground on the, in that particular country. And now after you have all this, well, usually there are a set of club officers that need to be present in the club, but uh, we understand that during the first year that's going to be very difficult for a club until it stabilizes. But still, there is a, a minimum that the club founder should strive to achieve, especially because otherwise doing all the work is very hard and you can burn out, uh, which is at least a vice president of education that is in charge of uh, monitoring the educational progress of people, of members, and a vice president of membership that, well, tenders to members, tends to members, um, manages guests, follow up some interest requests or leads, if you want to call them that way, and uh, things like that. And the final step is finding a venue for the meeting. And here, well, it's a good idea to ask for help, both in the groups and to us, because we many times come across some rather unexpected situation, especially because we, people like us, that's good, that's very comforting, because we obviously not, don't have any financial, and we make that pretty clear, we don't have any financial, goals and uh, for example we did a campaign in Mexico in Mexico and in Mexico City one person said oh I, I loved your idea and well I myself cannot join because I'm too busy but I do have a theater that you can use for your clubs meetings and I would be glad if you can uh, host your meetings here or in Rabat in Morocco we had a similar case in which uh, a person had a school and in, he offered like a complete uh, basement well it sounds Basement sounds very harsh, but it was a really nice place. He said, well, there are a lot of organizations meeting at my place, and I would be honored to have you as well. So, yeah, you can find help in unexpected places. If that doesn't work, then usually reaching out to schools, universities, libraries works because of the educational nature of our foundation. And it usually works even better if you offer them a win-win situation in, win in which you offer... Uh, the you explain the benefits of the clubs to their students so it's like the university or the school has an optional additional activity that they can offer to their students without them having to do absolutely anything about it just giving a, a space that they already have and in fact we do support that if you need some official letter from agora with our legal registration the legal information is on the wiki anyway but if you need something like an official paper stating that we are educa an educational foundation and that this club, club is affiliating with us and that we are recognized as such and you want that to be sent to the dean of the school or the university, whatever, we can do that. I mean, we do support those things, no problem. Just tell us who to, to address it to and we'll, we'll do it. If that doesn't work, you can always try pubs, coffee shops, restaurants, Usually owners are very receptive, especially in times where there are not many customers in offering a room or part of the venue at least. But if it's a, a time where there are not many customers, a part of the venue is usually good enough in ex for free in exchange for members just offering a drink or maybe staying after the meeting for, for dinner. That usually works well. And if everything else fails, you can always use also open spaces. In fact, uh, some clubs that do have a venue in Madrid, for example, or in Portugal, 
they do go out in public parks, parks or in public uh, amphitheaters and they do hold meetings there. And it's both a challenging thing for members, pushing them out of their comfort zone because oh, you're already speaking on the street. You're not, no longer in your comfortable, friendly club environment protected by four walls. No, you, there are strangers looking at you and it's quite a strange situation. And, um, but it's also a very useful uh, activity as an outreach and recruiting activity because contrary to what many people fear, that people are going to start laughing at them or ridiculing them or what is this guy doing, speaking on the street, or shouting there, or doing things, people are quite supportive. They are curious. They come up to the organizers of the meeting. They start asking questions saying, oh, well, that's nice. I would like to join. It's quite interesting, actually. So, yeah, you can do that. Um, again, don't yeah. wait to find the perfect venue. What we usually do, we always go to different universities. Yeah, yep. it's like sort of an outreach program, like campus awareness campaign. You know, exactly, like exactly, exactly. Yeah. But what, what we are doing, uh, we are we're also working to have our own domicile by mm -hmm. putting up like a library cafe, partnering with other stakeholders because we really don't have the resources, but we have the ideas. We have you know stuff like this, so we are like enticing you know partners. Yep. Who are yeah, who have the resources, exactly. right? If they believe in the cause of the project and that, you know, mm. and yeah, that's what we're working for as well. Yep. Well, as, as always, if absolutely everything fails, you can rent a venue. Uh, of course, this means charging members. Whether you find a suitable venue for a reasonable price, uh, that's a bit very up in the air. In some, in some cities, it's really difficult to rent a venue at a reasonable price. And, and not that cities that you would regard as exp expensive in general, but I don't know, places like Jakarta or Dakar, it's really hard sometimes. Yeah. Okay, so how does the actual club registration look like? But very easy actually. You, you need to schedule a first meeting, like a chartering meeting with the minimum number of members, submit a registration form online, and then we announce publicly that meeting to try to help with membership. Well, the meeting must be scheduled at least a week in advance, otherwise we really don't have enough time. And that's it, and you're done. And then hopefully you share uh, pictures of your success, uh, not only for, uh, I don't know, um, good, uh, the good feeling, but also because it always inspires and encourages others when they see that our club has, has started running. And, and just I got today, for example, pictures from two meetings from Ghana, I don't know, two, two weeks and a half ago, we didn't have any presence in Ghana, and now we're opening four clubs there. And now some, just some short notes on branding, because we do allow, allow a lot of freedom in the way our digital assets are used in creation of merchandising and uh, stationery and all sorts of materials. Uh, in, in fact, we don't have the ability to sell anything like that, and we don't want to prioritize that. We don't have an online shop, for example. It has never been a priority. Uh, we, if you want a club banner, we can tell you, okay, this is the design, this is the template. You can uh, customize it, and then you can order it from whatever provider you choose locally, or you can order it, I don't know, from abroad. Sometimes it's more, it's cheaper. But even if you wanted to, we couldn't uh, uh, sell it to you. I mean, uh, it would be too complicated for us and not, definitely not a priority at this, at this time. So, uh, as always, the main goal, apart from the customary things of brand identity, conserving and preserving brand identity and all that, we come again to not confusing whatever clubs do with the, whatever the official organization does. There is a branding guideline of what things can and cannot be done with the, with the brand and with the logos. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to these four rules, basically. And the two of them uh, are related to not confusing what clubs do with what the foundation does. Obviously, we cannot supervise what clubs do. And we have no intention of. They can write all sorts of things, have their own hosting, publish things on the web. And the problem is that if that confusion happens if something that a club produces can be confused with a material from an official statement from Agora, then that can create problems for members elsewhere in the world. Again, we come to the same point. 
So that's why we always ask you to include both the club logo and the official logo, not only the official logo. You should have a club logo or at least the club name. And that the club name is, is the primary entity publishing that thing or creating that material should be bigger and come first, should be more prominent. And uh, well, uh, points three and four are just common sense in terms of, well, don't modify the logo, meaning don't stretch it, don't alter the proportions, don't change the colors, it's just for the sake of consistency of the brand. And of course, we don't allow commercial usage of the logo, of, well, the logo or all the Agora materials. So for example, here uh, in the guide, there are many more examples, but here you have two examples of something that is not correct because it looks like an official Agora communication and it looks like as if Agora is calling the meeting when it's not the case. And in the other three examples, it's correct. You can have equal sizes logos or only the, or the club logo much bigger, or the Agora logo somewhere there rotated, just showing affiliation, that's fine. Um, it's okay if you want to produce your own awards, your own merchandising materials, that's perfectly fine. The first example is from Avishaka Oratories in, in India, um, and they are, look quite nice. Uh, you can use elements of the logo as always. And just make sure these are club awards and that is clear. So for example, and, and you can sell them by the way, in the case of, uh, well, I hope you don't sell your awards but you can sell your merchandising materials. So if you want to, I don't know, do t-shirts or polos or caps and sell them, as long as they include the club logo as well as the other logo, that's fine. And it's a great way of raising money sometimes. As long as, as always, uh, the finances are clear in terms of the rules. There is all the things that we have are in what we call the brand portal. And you can download from there logos, you can download templates for agendas, meeting agendas, you can download, I don't know, uh, brochures, flyers, stationery in general, banner, club banners. There is, all of those are recommendations. I mean, you can come up with your own designs, that's fine. Uh, there's only one requirement, and it is that if you want to have a club banner, then it should be the standard one. And it's just from a point, perspective of being aesthetic because as we start organizing now regional conventions and international conventions and people usually come to those conventions carrying the banner of their club with pride as it should be if every club had their own format it would be a mess to be honest everyone having a different I don't know size different design it would look terrible to be honest so that's why for public events like this, in which more than one club participates, we do ask for the standard format to be used. But for materials that are used privately in the club, like roll-ups or posters or things like that, um, the club can design their own, that's perfectly fine, and they can uh, order them from wherever they consider most appropriate. We don't have any say in that. I and mean, we don't want to have any say in that. And we don't def definitely don't want to be selling those. <laughs> so basically that's it. All this not so short and not so concise introduction about our app, what we do, how we do it in the club creation process. So now if you have any questions, additional. Um. Our organization also attends like summit, international summit conventions and stuff. And I I uh, I learned that Agora also has like you know an upcoming like uh, an event in Lisbon, Portugal, or I, I'm sure that there will be like upcoming conventions or stuff like that. Yeah. Um. How can we attend? How can we attend if we are interested? Or what would be the mechanics? Or um, well, the mechanics. Those. Uh. Yeah. The international convention is a convention that is going to happen every year between the 15th of August and the 15th of, of uh, October, it depends on the organizing country. Every time it will be in a different continent. Well, that's our goal. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. want to monopolize like, well, all the time in Europe. Actually, uh, as an example, we chose Lisbon, although the, the foundation was founded initially in Spain, because there were many more clubs in Lisbon and we wanted to send a clear message that really the headquarters of the foundation don't, don't matter and uh, mm. do want a more like community approach one that makes sense 
So mm -hmm. those events are do have a ticket price. I think for Lisbon it's something like 79 euros or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, attending is simply, I don't know, paying the ticket price and just going there. If the, if the event is happening in Europe, we can provide an invitation letter once you have registered uh, in order for that to serve as a visa support document. Exactly, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, That's what happened when we attended in the Netherlands. Yeah, we asked for, for a letter yeah. of invitation. No, we can do that and that letter of invitation carries all our legal information and all that. Uh, but remember that it's up to the embassy whether they accept that, whether they require this. No, we, we really have absolutely no say there. We can mm -hmm. recommend though to try to get the visa, especially since we're in the Schengen area. For example, for Lisbon, uh, yeah, sure. we definitely wouldn't recommend going through some embassies. Well, I'm not going to say that on record, but there are embassies that are more, or countries that are more, let's say, flexible because they are target of less immigration and more tourism and they are much more willing to give visas than others and at the end of the day it, uh, it's the same but of course ideally you should do you should uh, ask for a visa in the country where the the convention is held like in this case portugal so let's see there's a question in the chat um <clears throat> when setting up the initial club details do we need to specify the names of the president of things uh not right now uh, with the only thing that we require in the form is a, a single contact person. That would be the president, I guess, or the founder. R right now, we don't have ready the system for online club management, so we don't either we don't uh, need, need need either officer list or membership list, and we don't have the capacity. Um, that's when adding into the Agora membership request form. I'm not sure. I understand that part, but anyway, the overall answer is that we only need a single contact person for registering a club. More questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nothing, remember you can unmute yourself and say it or just type it. Uh, well, for me, it's, it's clear so far. Uh, what I'm just like thinking is like, you know, um, how to submit, you know, my information, our logo and stuff like that. Is there like a yeah, platform where you can like, upload I, I, those stuff? I, I, I uh, yeah, Alex, what I'm thinking is like uh, um, the details on how to um, register our existing organization. I have like a certain... Okay. Since you or already, yeah, since you already have all the usual difficult parts of setting up... logos up, already. Yeah, we already have a logo that the existing. Then, in your case, I would say you should try to learn uh, in more depth because this is just an outline of what we do. Obviously, it's uh, okay. complex and there are more details. So just download the Agora Guide. That should be good enough. Um, read it, have your members read it, and, uh, and that's it, and they just, just register. It's uh, really easy and quick. <laughs> Nothing more to do. Okay. All right. Is there like a certain site that um, I could register, stuff like that, or I am ready? There is, yeah, there is this uh, club registration oh. survey that uh, oh, okay. I'll send you the link, and it's in the wiki as well. So when you're ready, it just, it's just a form that asks you, well, the things like club name and things like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jackie. More questions? Uh, what else? One thing that is interesting is like there is like a personal, you are like, uh, like personal improvement, stuff like that. I want to know more of that. Uh, yeah, I think along the way, I get to learn along the way. Uh, you've got really a lot of interesting things in yep. the for, for, uh, yeah. for Agora. I, I do want to insist that, especially because I see there are people from other organizations, you could, in the open source world, you can say that we are some sort of fork, if you want to consider it that way. But our goals are much more ambitious. As you can see in some of the sections, we do want to work towards 
um, promoting and actually uh, implementing peaceful coexistence and tolerance and not just in words but in actions and in trying to like for example address stereotyping of collectives address fake news uh, actual leadership in the communities so we have a much more let's say prominent social aspect in the organization um okay i have a question from stanley um, can an existing club can change its venue in the future yeah of course i mean you can change everything in a club uh, in in fact uh, the only reason we ask for the venue is because when we deploy the club management uh, system there will be a way for people to find a club in their proximity and they usually want to know where they meet because maybe it's not suitable or not convenient for them that particular location but yeah, uh, in, in fact, although now you need to tell us, in the future you will be able to do that yourself. I mean, you log on to the portal and you change whatever you want from the club and we don't intervene at all. That's our idea. And you can do it as many times as you, as you want. Well, obviously it's not good if you change the venue right before the meeting is going to take place. But so yeah, in short, yes. More questions? Okay, well, um, then we're going to finish here if you don't have any more questions. I, um, even if you have them after the meeting, feel free to just message me directly or post on the Agora group, um, whichever, or in the real time chat, that usually works very well. So again, thank you all for being here. I hope you liked what you saw and I hope you Yeah, I'm looking us. forward for more sessions like this or yeah, I'm looking forward. Are you really going to attend one more session of this? I'm going to say exactly the same things. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably if uh, things go well, uh, we do want to have specific training sessions on how to do good evaluations and how to do some particular sections uh, that people are finding difficult to, to implement and especially more recorded sections from meetings okay yeah thank you okay yeah, thank you everyone uh, have a nice day bye, bye. Mm -hmm.